Thank you so much for that introduction, Joseph. And yeah, so um, Tolga Demerel here with Agency Zoom. And I, I seem to spend a high percentage of my time uh, helping people build their comp plans into Agency Zoom. So I spend a high percentage of my time talking to people about their compensation plans and the questions they have. And it seems like there's not a lot of guidance there with respect to what is a winning comp plan. And I think a lot of people are just making things up and seeing how it, it goes along the way. So um, I decided to reach out to Craig, who is obviously one of, if not the best in the industry uh, nationwide, to kind of help me out with that subject to, to bring value back to everybody. Because um, with me spending so much time, what I have seen is that there are common themes with higher producing agencies, which we all strive to be. And then I've also seen some problems with comp plans themes with lower producing agencies. So what I'm kind of going to go over is some of those problems, then we're going to go into a detailed, like a common comp plan that I see, and then I'll kind of let Craig take over uh, from there. So let's chat about some common problems that I see with comp plans. So number one, Believe it or not, they're overcompensating underachievers and they're undercompensating overachievers. And I'm going to go into that a little bit uh, more detailed here shortly. I also believe that a lot of people are afraid to pay for production based on this 10% number, right? Or 9%, unfortunately, if you're in that scale, but 10% number. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more as well. Another thing I see is that plans are, are, are way too complicated. They're just too many variables, and the producers have a hard time um, really understanding how did this one sale impact my pay. And then finally, and maybe the most important, is the standards and expectations are set too low. And believe it or not, your comp plan has a huge part in how standards and expectations are in your agency. And that's kind of where Craig's going to take over with that. Obviously, he runs a high standard high expectation agency, and the result of that is uh, he gets high results, you know. So um, let's go ahead and run through a common comp plan that I see that has problems. So here's a common comp plan that I see, okay. Something like a $2,000 base, I'm just making up that number, the $2,000 base. It could be $1,800, it could be $3,000. I'm just making up a number, okay. I do see a lot of $2,000. And then I see tiers something like this. So you got your 10, 15, 20, so it goes up every five items or so, okay, 10 to 40. And then the comp starts really low, 2%, okay, which is fine. There's actually nothing wrong with that. But then it ends at like 8%, all right? So let, let's talk about what are some problems with this comp plan that we see here. So first of all, the standards are just too low. On that tier plan that we just saw, the max shown on the plan was 40 items, okay? And I'm a big believer that if you don't show somebody a really big number, like 120 items, okay, they're never going to believe it's possible because the max that you're showing them is 40. So they're probably going to end up around 30 or so. The next thing that I see is that this comp plan is not willing to pay. It maxes out at 8%, which we're going to talk about why uh, you may want to pay a lot more and why you should pay more than that or be willing to for people that overachieve, okay? The, the, again, going into that, it, this comp plan, believe it or not, is greatly overcompensating people that underachieve and greatly undercompensating people that overachieve, okay? So the last two things is kind of what I'm going to – we're going to get into the details about. So let's let's look at the details of this comp plan as it scales out, all right? This is what this comp plan looks like. So, again, the tiers were the 10 to 40, and the commission rates were 2 to 8%, okay? We're going to use an average premium per item of $500 just because that's easy. The next column over tells you what the total premium – produced by the in that in that tier okay then we apply the commission rate to come up with the monthly commission rate so for example in the 10 item the producer would receive a hundred dollars for the month and at the 40 item they would receive sixteen hundred dollars okay then you got their salary and when you add those two up 
you come up with their total monthly pay. So again, the person who wrote 10 items would receive $2,100, and the person who wrote 40 items would receive $3,600 for the whole month. And if you analyze those things, you see the yearly totals. Now, this is really important, okay? Because I'm gonna ask everybody a question, an, an analogy type question, okay? What would you be willing to pay for the following? And all this is gonna make sense, okay? This is hopefully that light bulb. So you, I want you guys to all think about this. What would you be willing to pay right now for a $5 million book of business? My guess is you're gonna be anywhere from 2.5X to three times, right? A 2.5 multiple to a three times multiple, okay? Now my next question for you is, what would you be willing to pay for a $10 million book, right? Those don't exist a lot out there. And if you can find a $10 million book, we're gonna pay for it. So it's definitely gonna be over three times, probably close to maybe over four, who knows? I mean, I would probably pay four for a $10 million book in one location, to be honest, okay? And then let's look at the opposite. How much would you be willing to pay for a $1 million book? We sure as hell aren't gonna pay 3X, right? We're gonna pay a lot less for that. We're gonna pay 1.5 to two. If we can get it for less than 1.5, great, even better. So when we look at this and we look at it like buying premium through the purchase of a book, what does this say? And how does it go back to your comp plan? It's all premium, gang. Remember, right? We're paying for the premium. So let's come back to that comp plan example and let's talk about what is that comp plan really paying? All right, so we already talked about how the 10 items is paying $2,100, and if we go all the way down through each iteration, 40 items is paying 3,600. What multiple is it really paying per tier, and what commission rate is it really paying? So if we look at that, we're gonna see that the 10 item comp plan is really paying a 4.2 multiple, okay? And it's really paying 42% commission, because the producer, only gave you $5,000 in premium, and you paid them $2,100. That's 42% commission rate is what you paid them. Now let's go all the way down the scale to your overachiever, because the way this comp plan is built, remember, it tops out at 40. Yeah, they can do 60, but you're saying somebody is an overachiever if they hit 40 with the design of that comp plan. Now let's go all the way down, and that one is only paying 1.8 multiplier and an 18% commission. Okay, now I wanna tie that back to when I asked you the question, what would you pay for that book of business? There's no doubt about it. We would pay a higher for 10 million, pay a little bit less for a five, and we wouldn't pay much at all for one. Why? Because that makes sense, right? You don't pay a lot for a big book or a small book, you pay more for a big book. Same thing here. I hope you guys can see the problem. This comp plan is greatly overcompensating 42% for the people who achieve 10, and we're basically cheating the people who are overachievers and only paying them a 1.8X, okay? So the arrow on this is going down when those numbers should be flipped the other way around. It really should be flipped the other way around, where your people who are underachieving, and uh, God, 10 shouldn't even be on the board. I mean, we shouldn't even be talking to somebody about 10 items but they should not be receiving 4.2, right? And then your, your, you know, your 70 item people should be more closer to that higher multiple rate in the commission. So that's one thing that I encourage people to do is to evaluate your comp plan, see what are you paying people who underachieve, what are you paying people who hit the benchmarks, and what are you paying people who overachieve with respect to percentages paid. So with that being said, we're gonna pick the brain of somebody I really respect, Craig Wiggins here, okay? 21 year Allstate agent, I mean, seriously, he's a legend. I, I'm gonna go through these things, but everybody knows Craig, he's a legend. I personally um, have known Craig, I don't know, for three or four years now, and I've learned a lot from him, and every time I speak to him, he's extremely positive, motivational, started pure scratch, four locations, two states, $32 million in premium, and he manages a team of 28 uh, with the help of an awesome Joseph as well. So with that being said, I'd like to open it up with a question to Craig.
Okay. So, Craig, I'd like for you to tell us a little bit about the standards and culture of your agency and how your comp plan helps support those things. Well, thanks, Toba, man. What, what an unbelievable introduction. I really appreciate that. And, and thanks for inviting me to be on this call with you. And for, look, for those of you that don't know Tolga, which I think there's a lot of people on, you know, that we invited as well, this guy, he is one of the smartest in the industry. If you're not affiliated or part of Agency Zoom, you need to check that out. Um, the way he's able to help people understand where they are and keep track and keep score of what the production is looking like um, that's a huge part of this entire subject we're talking about right now. So thanks, Togo. Thanks for thanks for inviting me to the call, and and uh, I, I encourage everybody to get out there and and uh, be a part of Agency Zoom and listen to what Togo's got to say. He hasn't been here nearly as long as I am, and he's way ahead of where I was when uh, when when I was at his point in my career. So um, this guy, he, he's got it going on. When it comes to our agency and the standards and the culture and, and the comp and the way all that fits together, you know, I think, first of all, you have to, and he said it earlier in the presentation, right, when you've got the 40 item max, and you, you've got to paint a picture where people can do a lot more than what they think they can do. You're, I mean, your responsibility as an owner is really to be a leader, right? You're there to to develop, to train, to coach, but mainly to really get people to believe in themselves that they can do more than really what they think they can do. You know, so if your comp plan has a cap to it in terms of what they can hit, uh, chances are that's probably what they're going to think is, is acceptable as far as a top-end goal. You know, and, and we really, you know, we, we have a top-end, I guess you say, on our comp plan just for the percentage part, but it's a lot higher than 40. And I want people to do way, way more than that. We've got – this month, I think we have three people on pace for over 100, and we've got one on pace for over 200. You know, so a lot of that is just them understanding, you know, what's possible. Um, we hate the word realistic around here. It's it's really more about, hey, what can we achieve? Um, you know, 100 items a month is five items a day. 200 items a month is, is 10 items a day. So you know, have you ever done that before in one day? Well, if you've done it one day, why couldn't you do it in 20 days in a row? You know, so – I think that the standards and, and expectations are a huge part of our culture and begins from that very first meeting when we first start talking to them through the onboarding process. And it's just something that we reinforce with Joseph, with Stephanie, with Al, and the other leaders that I've got here that are helping, and they do a fantastic job working with everybody to develop them and make sure they understand, you know, hey, the sky's the limit. And I am totally in agreement with Tolga that – you got to pay people, you know, everybody wants to get paid what they're worth, right? You want to get paid what you're worth. I want to get paid what I'm worth, what, whatever it is that I'm doing, whatever it is you're doing, you know, and your staff is the same way. So if you've got somebody in there that's freaking killing it and they're, they're barely making more money than someone else that really should be fired, you know, that doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, people, they need to be rewarded for what they're doing. So, you know, looking at our comp plan, and this, this is a, a, a very, very common plan we share it throughout the country. A lot of people are using it. Uh, it's, it's really simple. Like Tolga said, you get it too complicated, and it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you notice, it starts off at 3.5% for up to 24. If someone's doing the 24 or really 25, under 40, they're not going to be here very long. It's really just for example purposes. And in some markets of the country, you know, maybe that's something that you've got to consider. But if you notice, it goes all the way up to 125 items. You know, the top end goal with a commission rate of 12%. People are like, wait, wait, I don't even make 12%. Well, how can you pay 12%? Well, you know, it's just like you said earlier when you're, when you're buying a book, you're buying premium, you're buying that lifetime value of that customer, you know, over the next five, six, seven, most, most customers average around seven to eight years. So you're buying all that renewal premium going forward in addition to all the other opportunities that we have today. You know, particularly if you're with Allstate. Now we got a lot of Allstate people on the phone. You know, with the bonuses, with, with, with IPS, with survey money, all the things available to you, enhanced comp for you that are, that are new. Man, the, the sky's the limit on comp. There's no reason. You shouldn't be afraid not to pay it out. But if you look at that plan, it's very, very basic. Um, it has some, you know, some, some qualifiers in there. There's some, there's some chargebacks. We have qualifiers for IPS, you know, for life applications. we got people who are doing 15, 20 a month, you know, for, for agencies to be at nine and nine. Um, because they can't get one a, a month is is pathetic. I mean, really, I'll just say it. I mean, if you're working 20 days a month and you can't get one life app issued in a month, when we've got staff people that are doing 10 or 15 or up to 20 a month, 
Um, you really need to reevaluate what's going on. But this plan is, is, is very simple to follow. The people that do more, they make more. The people that, you know, add more value in terms of line 10, add more value with life insurance, they make more. You know, and then we, we do have a charge back in there uh, for people that, you know, have stuff. Fall. And really that's mainly to monitor if someone's writing a bunch of crap, right? I mean, charge back every once in a while is not going to hurt anybody. You see somebody in there that's constantly putting stuff on that you're having to charge back, well, you really have a bigger problem than just the comp itself, right? So we have that in place just to make sure we're going through that. And we do apply it to everybody equally, but it's really just to kind of make sure that things are the way they're supposed to be. And then in addition to our comp plan, our base comp plan, we do promotions every single month. This one, um, this is the promotion for May, and this is for um, this is for Alabama. Yeah, this is Alabama, I'm trying to make sure. This is for Alabama. So if you look, big, big money, right? So if we if we do as a group, you know, 350, 375, 400 items, I'm looking at the left, the bottom left-hand corner over there, everybody – makes a big bonus as long as they've got their minimum uh, qualifiers for, for ALR, for total items, and for line 10s. You know, and, and, and we, and I want to make this point really clear, we incentivize items, okay? This, this, this comes up all the time where people are really, they're, 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 they're very firm on paying on premium. And if you want to pay on premium, that's fine. That's the beautiful thing about being you know, an, a, a, an agency owner, whatever company it is you're with, you know, if you're, if you're uh, exclusive where you can do this on your own, you know, at, at Allstate, it's beautiful that we can all come up with our own plans. Premium to me is not the way to do it because that's not how I am rewarded, right? When I, when at the end of the year, when I'm going to calculate my bonus, it's all based off item growth. So I would much rather someone write 10 cars for 350 bucks a piece than one homeowner's for $3,500. And historically, I've been doing this for over 20 years, the way you grow your book is through standard auto production. That's how you grow a book of business over time. You know, if you have a great auto month, the next month when you look at your reports, chances are that's where you're going to see the most growth. So we want them to be really engaged on the auto side, you know, but, but looking at this promo, we have a lot of things, and this this will vary. You know, I'll I'll do something different next month. I did something different, you know, two months ago. It just depends on you know where we are, what we want to accomplish, what we think is important. The point of all this, and some people might look at it like, oh my God, that's a lot of money. Look, if if you are going to go out and hire a marketing company, and they promised you, look, you can have X number of items next month for a certain dollar amount, and all you had to do is stroke them a check to get it. You know, would you do that? And let's just say they were going to promise you 100 items for $1,000. Would you pay a marketing company 100 items for $1,000? Of course you would, right? So why wouldn't you do the same thing for your staff? Throw money out there and let them chase it and watch what happens. We'll have people make a bunch of money. You know, and, of course, there are some things in here with scale where maybe we can do a little bit more because we've got, you know, more reward at the end of the year. Um this is for the Alabama side. So we also have one for the Georgia side as well because every market is a little bit different. You'll notice over there, you know, the, the individual bonus on the right-hand side, it's 50 items instead of 100. In Alabama, it was 100. Well, the market's a little different in Georgia. Expectations are a little bit different in Georgia. But we still have a lot of the same type of, you know, structure to the plan where we give them big money if they do a great job. You know, if you look over there on the bottom left-hand side, you know, if we do 150 items in Georgia, Again, George is different. With at least 50 line 10s, then there's a $3,000 bonus. You know, they got to have at least five ALR applications, at least 30 items, at least 10 line 10s. And some people might say, Man, that's a lot of money for, for 150 items. But at the end of the year, that book over there is almost $10 million. The bonus was supported. It pays for it. It makes sense. The lifetime value of those customers. And, look, I've been doing things like this for a long time, not just today, not just with size today, but – Going back to the very beginning, even when I was scratch, I constantly, and I think Togo would agree with this, you put money out there to get people to chase it so that they can reach their full potential so you can grow, so that you can get where you want to go. You know, and, and low performers, you never got to worry about them. They're not going to get there anyways. The high performers, if they get it and they make that money, then great. And that's what you want to do. You want to pay that. So, you know, these two promos, this is a really, this is a sample we'll send you. All that, we'll send you a copy of this webinar, but then we'll also send you uh, what we do with our comp, 
what we did with our um, with our promos. And there's some, there's some other things I'll give you in there as well as far as accountability. You know, accountability is a huge part of being successful. You know, when you look at what someone should be doing every day, um, there's a daily activity uh, sheet that I'll give you as well to make sure that people are, are, are where you're at, you're making sure they're accountable for their daily actions just as much, if not more so, than their actual results. Because what they do during the day is going to lead to what they actually produce. So we want to look at everything, you know. And, and look, every every day is so important, right? Your comp plan has to be correct for your situation. You know, for us, with our size, with our bonus, the qualifications, the things we have to do to max out, to get where we want to go, it's not just every month's important. It's every day is important. I mean, we look at everything. And that's why agency Zoom is really so critical. You know, we started a program, Joseph and I did, uh, years ago internally to kind of keep up with what we were doing. And then we would email production all throughout the day and live real time anytime someone wrote something. Well, Toga has taken that and created a platform for any agency owner to, to go out there and have access to. And I'm telling you, you have to have that because people have to know where you are. I mean, I got on, I looked at my phone before we even got on this call, how many items do we have for the day, you know, right now? Because I know we need at least 20 in Alabama to get where we want to go. And so I look at it every hour. I mean, every, every minute it's constantly being updated as we write business. So I would encourage you, if you're not already involved with Agency Zoom, to get involved with that so that you can keep track of that and couple that with a solid comp plan to make sure that people are incentivized correctly and that you're holding them accountable and then you can see what's going on all throughout the day. So, you know, Toga, if you want to just kind of maybe have a little back and forth, have a little conversation about some of this stuff, uh, I'll be glad to talk for a little while before we uh, before we open it up to Q&A. Yeah, man, awesome. And, uh, man, that was really powerful information that I even took some notes from, to be quite frank with you. Uh, it's always a learning opportunity, so I appreciate you sharing all that extremely valuable stuff. I do definitely have some follow-up questions, as I assume other people may, so I encourage people to jot those questions. And then, um, Joseph, if, if you could just let us know if there's any questions, that would be fantastic. So here's a question that I get, Craig, a lot from people. Could you kind of talk about salary slash base pay versus 100% commission, draws, et cetera, with your 23 years of experience? Um, could you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure, no problem. First of all, we're specialized, okay? So we have uh, service people, we have sales agents, we have managers, we have admin people, we have operations manager. We've got a lot of different positions. Everybody gets a salary. Everybody that's on service is almost 100% salary because I want them focused on taking care of people like their family and not worried about a lot of production requirements. So there's no production requirements on them whatsoever. They do have some spiffs and commissions, just bonuses, that type of thing, but they don't have to worry about that to make a living. The salespeople, we believe, I believe, that they need some sort of small base sort of salary so they're just not waking up broke every day um, and that varies varies on based on market varies on experience very based on you know who it is that we're talking about but can range anywhere from 1500 even all the way up to 2500 depending on the market um, just to make sure that they've got something I, I don't want people to feel like everything is 100 percent commission because in my experience that just doesn't work very well if someone has a bad month Man, it, it can it can completely ruin them financially, and, and then they leave, they go find something else, and you've lost somebody that you know you could have kept if you were just paying them a, a small salary. So, I, I'm not a big fan of draws. I like a small salary of 1,500 to 25, somewhere in there, um, plus a very heavily weighted comp plan on top of that, with that's incented for them to do the things that are important to you. You know, and for us, that's item growth. Um, so. Those those are my thoughts. I don't know where you where you fall on that Togo, but that's that's the way I structure everything so that I get the results that I'm looking for. No, no I'm kind of glad you said that. I'm in line uh, with that 100%. I um, I call it a guaranteed minimum. They never pay it back. So my people get either their minimum pay, which is very small in respect to their commission, or they get commission, whichever is greater. Essentially, it's a salary, right? So uh, yeah. it's the same thing. They don't have to pay it back for that. Um, you know, I, I, if my top guy, if he has a bad month, I'm cool. You know, I'll give him some money because I know next month he's going to do double the production because I know I can count him. So I think we're in line 
uh, with respect to that. So I appreciate you sharing that as well. I, I, I'd like to pick the brain some more if you don't mind. Is that cool? Sure. Sure. Okay. So um, your comp plan, we know it's a winning comp plan, right? I know that you are putting up numbers, but I also know that there are lots and lots of other agencies that who have implemented your comp plan that are also winning as a result of. How do I know that? Because of agency Zoom, okay? Now, do you feel like this could be a one-size-fit-all comp plan, or do you feel that comp plans may need to be adjusted for someone who, say, is a scratch agent versus someone who's getting to scale versus someone's at scale? Well, you know, I've used pretty much the same type of comp plan uh, for okay. years. I think probably the biggest the biggest differentiator in this whole thing is market, which will which will determine your salary. For example, you know, we're in Atlanta, we're in Alabama. In Atlanta, it's a different deal over there. You know, if you want to be competitive and really attract good talent, you're probably going to have to go up a little bit on the salary in, in order to get some of those people to come. But everything on the top part of it. As far as the actual scales and the percentages, it doesn't matter whether you're scratch or whether you're 50 million. You can make that work, you know, if your goal is to grow items. That's what our goal is, to grow items, hit IPS, make sure we get where we need, where we need to go on the, on the ALR side. So, you know, the tweaks that are made when I work with people individually, what we look at is the salary. And sometimes, here's a little trick for some of you guys. If you're trying to recruit somebody, and let's say they're making – 50 grand a year, 60 grand a year, you know this could be a you know Michael Jordan on your basketball team, and you just got to get them over there, but you don't want to pay them a 50 or $60,000 a year salary. What you can do is kind of like what Toba said a minute ago, you can do a guarantee, right? You can say, look, I'll pay you a $60,000 guarantee for 90 days, and the comp plan is going to stay the same. And then what, what happens with you is that gives you an opportunity. If they come in and kill it, then great, it doesn't cost you anything because they're going to make more than that every month anyways. But if they come in, they don't do it, and they don't do a great job of it. You know, the way our onboarding program works, we've got requirements the first four weeks anyways, you know, on a weekly basis. So if they're not going to – if they don't hit it, you're just kind of taking a chance week by week. You don't have a lot of money invested in somebody like that. So there's ways to kind of blend the plan and change it slightly based on the person, especially on the very beginning, you know, to try to attract those people that you want to attract. Craig, I'd like, to, I'd like to follow up on that uh, last part there where you talked about your four-week program because I think that's a critical component to the comp plan because I don't know about you, but when I'm recruiting somebody who I, uh, you know, I'm in love with, right, one, I'm selling them on my comp plan and the full potential of that comp. And I feel that it's extremely important that this person gets off to a quick start because if they don't, then I've sold them on a bag of lies, right? I'm showing them that they can make $100,000 but their first month they're not making much. So I've implemented, actually, this is a fact, talked about the 90-day plan and having a step-by-step uh, -step plan. And immediately after I left there, I created that plan and I've seen the results of that. Can you talk about how important that is with respect to the comp plan, getting people off to a quick start so that they can achieve the results they expect to achieve? Uh, absolutely, and Joseph's pulling up some of those documents now on his desktop uh, to hopefully share with everybody. But yeah, look, the, the, one of the biggest problems in agencies all over the country is expectations and standards not being clearly defined and communicated through the interviewing process and then holding those people accountable once they come on, right? So on the screen now, you'll see our accountability pyramid, and this is for everybody. You know, we're looking for a minimum of two items a day, okay, every single day. That puts them at 40 items a month. That's, a, that's kind of our minimum deal. If they don't have two items – then we're looking for 10 quotes, all right? So they got to have 10 quotes for that day if they don't have two items. If they got the quotes and they didn't get the items, then we, 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 you know, it's our responsibility to coach them up. We're going to coach them anyways, but we're going to look at that stuff and, and do what we got to do to get them the two items. If they don't have 10 quotes, then we're looking for 80 phone calls. So this is kind of a, a daily accountability regardless of time period, but from for a brand-new person onboarding them correctly, we might have that form as well. If we do, we'll pull that up. We're looking for a minimum production on the very first week. You know, I talk to people sometimes like, well, he's only been here for 90 days, and i got to give him time to get ramped up. We don't believe that. We really don't. And we feel like, look, we hire a lot of people that have no experience whatsoever, and someone that's coming brand new to our business, you know, with, with no license but has a network of family and friends, is it really un, un, unachievable for them to hit five or ten items in their first week? 
I don't think it is. If you look at this, this is our minimum expectations for the onboarding requirements. And again, if you text, we'll throw that in there as well. Week one, ten items. Week two, you know, six items, eight items. It, it, it changes through that first month, six, seven, eight, and then goes to thirty, thirty-five, and forty. We want that first week to be one of their best weeks when they first start. But the whole point of this is to show them, look, this is what we're expecting from you. You know, you're brand new, but if you don't get at least ten items in that first week. This is probably not the place for you, right? And then the next week, six, seven, eight, why does it drop off a little bit? Because chances are they're going to unload their pipeline that first week, right? And they're going to have some stuff that carries over to the next week, and maybe it's not quite as big. That's okay. I'm all right with that. As long as they do 10, 6, 7, and 8, I'm okay with that through the first month. The point is, and maybe in your market, maybe where you are, maybe you adjust that a little bit, but you can't just bring somebody on and say, hey, go do a good job. And then at the end of the month, they have, you know, seven items, and you're like, well, try harder next month. You know, I, you got to have some standards. you got to be clear about them. you got to hold them accountable, both on a weekly can you, basis. Can you pull that up? Yes. I'm, I'm sorry. Can you pull that back up, that last one? Because I want to talk about this, because I think this is so critically important. Um, yes. and, I, and that's awesome that you're going to send this out there for free to people. That's really cool. Um, this, I think, is so important with compensation because – when I talk to people sometimes and just – what I feel like is that in the back of our head – and I've been guilty as charged. I'm raising my hand right now, guys. Sometimes in the back of our head, we subconsciously have an expectation that some – that maybe we've been burned in the past, that the person is not going to come out of the gate hot, and that we are then scared to to, to put out a lot of compensation potential out there because we might be on the hook for a lot of money for someone who doesn't produce a lot. But when you have certain goals in the beginning and you change the way you think into this guy is going to produce 30 items his first month, 40 his second, 30, and they actually achieve those results because of the plan that you have in place, then you don't care about paying them the comp, right? Because It'd be safe to say if everybody's producing 60 items at your agency every single month, well, hey, I don't even look at what I'm paying them as long as my bank account's good, right? So That's right. It, these little things tie into so much to the comp plan. They're not a part of the comp plan, but it's the standards and expectations that get you to feel more confident about willingness to put up more money. Does that make sense, uh, Craig, that when I speak uh, about that? Uh, absolutely, and you, you are so right. And that's really such a big roadblock for so many people. You know, they look at, you know, sometimes investing in their agency, they look at spending money out of their pocket. You know, I hear that a lot. You know, I can't afford that. Look, you can't afford not to pay people the right way so they get where you want to go. And, yeah, is it, is it taking a chance on some money? Well, look, when you have minimum expectations, if you go back to that last slide, Joseph, when you have minimum expectations those first few weeks, and you got somebody – look, let's just take week one. Let's say the guy starts off with a $2,000 salary, right? What, 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 is my, what is my risk for this guy that's starting off on a $2,000 week – or $2,000 a month salary plus the commission 500 plan? Bucks. That I have, 500 bucks. 500 bucks. How, how many Internet leads is that for people that are buying Internet leads? I mean, it's nothing. It's nothing. And see, what happens is people that don't have these, these expectations and accountability, they start them off at maybe whatever their salary is, whatever their comp plan is, they ride them for three, four, five, six months, spend 10, 15, 20 grand on somebody, and then they get rid of them. So really, who's taking the bigger risk, right? I'm not. I've got $500 at risk. And see, what I'm not going to run anybody through binding authority until they've proven that they can sell. So I'll let somebody else buy them. They're licensed. They can talk to people. I'll let somebody else buy them the business. So I'm not going to bring them on and spend a lot of time and money they either can prove that they can do the job on the very beginning or, or, or they don't. You know, I mean, it's like a tryout for a football team. You come out there and you make it work and you make the team or you don't. I don't have a lot of money at risk. I don't have a lot of time at risk. You know, and, and once they've proven themselves through the, especially the first week, when someone gets through their first week, it really shows us, hey, this is somebody we can work with. And now we're going to pour it on. We're going to spend time with them. And I could put three, four, five people on the phone right now that would tell you straight up, if it hadn't have been for that accountability, if it hadn't have been for those those weekly requirements, they wouldn't be hitting 80, 90, 100 items a month right now because in their mind, they wouldn't have thought it was possible, right? So when, when you show somebody, look, 100 items a month is five items a day. Here's how we're going to get there. 
you hold them accountable in the very beginning and show them, you know, what's really possible, you know, things start to happen. But it all starts with the owner. The owner has to communicate that vision and that message to these people when they first start talking to them and has to continue all through the onboarding process and as they go throughout their career. And you can't be afraid to invest in your people. That's the number one asset you've got as an agency owner is your people, right? We don't have any inventory. We don't have anything else we've got to worry about. The only issue that we have, and it's not rates or guidelines, it's your staff. If you develop your staff, you pay them right, you coach them up, you show them what's actually possible out there, and you lead them in the right direction to reach your full potential, you're going to win. But it, but, it, but it all starts in the very, very beginning with the way you pay them, the way you talk to them, the way you develop them, all the expectations, everything. It, it all flows together. Awesome, man. Awesome. So, um what I would like to do right now is kind of summarize some bullet points from what we talked about. I'm going to end it with one final question to you, Craig, and then, Joseph, we can open it up. So, listen, I'm one of the top producing agents in my region. Actually, we're number one. And I can tell you I learn from them every day, all day, okay? So I encourage everybody to join that platform. But there's no reason uh, not to invest in yourself because you're going to get gold like this webinar plus pots of gold uh, that I wish I could provide myself, but the, a lot of smart people like Craig Wiggins and Joseph have put together. So let me summarize some of the things that I heard here, and then I'm going to end it with one last question. So what I heard um, and, and, and what I see is, first, you have to develop a comp plan that sets high expectations, right? <laughs> exactly. Se no and standards, high expectations and standards. Secondly, you know, as an agency owner, no matter what kind of agency you run, you can do what you want with your comp plan, but what we see as a common theme is that items works best. It's easy for your producers to understand. It's how you get compensated. You have no control over premium, right? You don't set the premium on a policy. Items are items are items. So really think about redeveloping your comp plan based on items. The other thing is keep it simple. Items, IPS, and sprinkle in some bonuses so that your team can have fun. Bonus them on what you want to motivate, uh, and don't be afraid to motivate. And then finally, don't be afraid to overcompensate people who overachieve. In fact, do it. Just do it. Take Nike's slogan and make sure the people that are overachieving, based on the standards and expectations, you know, don't, don't assume overachieving is not 20. I don't care if most people in your agency are averaging 10 items a month. 20 is not overachieving, okay? So, you know, let's set the bar higher. If, it, if it's 10, let's – Push them to 30 or 40, okay? Two items a day is a great benchmark uh, that I see being used a lot. So what I want to ask you, Craig, is because there's a lot of valuable information here, let's say that um, somebody uh, wants to reevaluate their comp plan and they want to make changes. What do you think the best way is to go about making changes in an agency without completely disrupting, you know, pe the way people feel or the culture? Now, that is a great question, and that comes up a lot. And actually, I've been through that many times myself. You know, the, the, the thing about changing your comp plan is, number one, you got to do it, okay? You have to, you have to, if you're on a very basic plan, it's not incentivized the right way, you're overpaying, underpaying, you got to make a change. Now, there's, a, there's several ways you can do it. You can just black and white change it and not worry about it and just deal with whatever happens. Um, you can blend it, meaning you can take what you have now, blend it with a new plan, run that a while. What I've done in the past when, when I felt like it was going to be a huge disruption is I would run the new plan with the old plan uh, for 90 days and then just pay the higher up and give them a little time to kind of wean off of that That's old great. Plan that's great advice. Doing. I think that's great. Right? Yeah. And that way you don't – and, and here's what happens with that. The low performers, the ones you don't want anyways, they're the ones that leave. The, the ones that are going to make it, they see the better plan, and it's like, whoa, okay, now here's what I can do. This is what's really possible, and it gets them excited, and you actually move forward in a positive direction. So I kind of like that for my situation, um, and you kind of have to you know, analyze the people that you've got and how they're going to react. Don't let your people hold you hostage, though. Don't let them determine how you're going to pay and what you're going to do going forward. If you got the wrong people in there, you got the wrong people in there. I mean, that's just – that's just something that you got to deal with. But those are the those are some options on getting off of an old plan and, and moving towards a new one. 
Awesome, man. Awesome. So, yeah, that's all I got unless you have some final words, and then um, I'm all about opening it up for any questions. I'm not, Joseph, I'll kind of hand it off to you, I guess. Well, I can tell you what, so I'm, I'm going to give it to Joseph a minute to moderate this Q&A, but I, I just, okay. again, I want to thank you um, for, for doing this, for oh, inviting man. me. I think uh, this this is something that will be valuable to a lot, because this is like, I mean, where you find people and how you pay them. That's like the two top topics, right? I have a problem with staffing and, of course, leads, those kind of things, but how how do you find people? How do you pay people? It's a common issue, and, um, you know, all of us, and I know Tolga's included in this, Guys, we just want to help you. You know, we really, truly want you to get better. We want you to succeed. And how you pay people is a huge part of that. So, look, man, I, I appreciate you reaching out to me and uh, and asking us to, you know, to be involved in this with you. And I think a lot of people will benefit from this call. And of course, we'll have the recording. We'll get it out there and and play it for a lot of folks. But but thanks so much. And I'll turn it over to Joseph. We got a ton of questions. Uh, we'll get through as many of them as we can and just kind of go back and forth on that, I guess. And uh, and uh, try to finish on time. Here you go, Joseph. Thanks, Tolga. All right. So we have a question here from Stan Martz. Where do your leads come from? And I'm going to add Catherine's question, Catherine Allen's. What's the key to getting large items daily? So how, where do you get your leads, and how do you write so much daily? Just like all agencies, we both have different approaches, right? We have similar but yet different. So. Um, First of all, I always, when I talk about leads and getting those high numbers, it's all about the expectation. So when I hire somebody, the expectation is a minimum of two items per business day. By the way, that pyramid is, is exactly what I model in my agency. It's the simple solution to getting the high numbers, two items per business day. Okay. Then I talk to the people that I hire about how are you going to get to the two items per business day, a.k.a. 44 items in a month, right? And what I tell them is this. I am not going to give you enough leads to get there. It's not going to happen, okay? Immediately at the beginning, I tell them that. Again, it's about expectations because if people expect that in order to get to the results that they're just going to depend on what, uh-uh, that's not what we're running here. And then what I follow up with is this. I tell them that you are the CEO of your desk, okay, and, you, and your business. And your business just so happens to be in my agency. And guess what? Right next to you, there's another CEO who owns a very similar business that just so happens to be in my agency. But you guys are competing businesses, okay? And what I tell them is both of you are going to receive one stream of income which is leads for me. But those leads aren't going to be nearly enough to get you to the results that you need to get to. It's up to you to implement additional streams of income into your business, a.k.a. your desk. For example, referrals from mortgage partners. If you implement that stream of income into your desk and the guy next to you does it, who's going to have higher results? Okay? But that's going to take some work on your end. Then let's look at another stream of income, which is apartment complexes. Let's look at another stream of income, referrals from past clients, X dates. You guys get the point, right? So um, I, there's no magic lead vendor or anything like that. Anybody says that, oh, data lot's the best or anything, that, that's wrong. That you'll never, it, it, that's not going to work for anybody. I think it's all about expectations and clearly helping people map out a path. And if we just tell people, hey, your goal is 44, I'm going to help you get there with leads. I mean, it, man, that's a lot of leads. You're going to you're going to be spending a lot of money to get to that number. And and then how do you get to 80? I'm telling you, you ain't getting 80 items. And you sure as hell ain't getting to 100 items um, on leads. It's not going to happen. And I think that might be a good segue because you're the best in the industry, I, I think, with the COI. So you maybe I'll let you take over from there, Craig. Well, man, that answer was gold. Hopefully. If you're listening to this on the recording right now, you need to rewind and listen to all that because that was money. I mean, that's he's exactly right, you know. And and if you people, if you're hiring people and they come on and think, you know, you're just going to give me all these leads and it's my responsibility to work the leads and that's how I'm going to make a living. That is so wrong. I mean, we have a lot of opportunity, right, within the book, especially if you have a bigger book, you know, to cross sell and work win backs and requotes and that type of thing. But referrals is how you're going to win. You know, that's where, I mean, that's, that's the gravy, you know. So, you know, we do a lot to try to help put our people in a position to win with referrals. There's a lot of things that you can do. We've done a lot of, you know, one-hour webinars about how to go out and cultivate that. 
but you have to make that a part of what they're doing. You know, and some people are better at that than others. I mean, that's just the way it is. In our in our organization, we've got some people, they just burn the phone ups, you know, calling calling old leads and, you know, requotes and win backs, and then we got other people that love to get out. The people that get out, they always outperform per phone call everybody else. It's not even close. You know, we've got one, she's on pace right now for 200-something items this month. I think she averages about 40 calls a day because she has such great relationships with her centers of influence. So, Tolga is exactly right. It can't just be about what kind of leads you guys have. It's, that's part of it. We're going to help you with that. We're going to give you maybe a little bit. But like a new hire that comes on, we require them to have 50 deck pages before their first day. That's one of the, the hurdles they got to jump through to, to be able to start. And we want that because we want them, number one, to show that they can prospect, right? If they can't do that with their own friends and family and their own network before they come on, how are they ever going to do it when they get here? And then number two, it gives them something obviously to work that first week so they can try to get to that 10-item goal. But we require that in the very beginning so that they can prove that they're able to make that happen. And and we'll help them with that. I think as, as the owner, it's your responsibility to try to, you know, help and be the leader and, you know, provide a lot of guidance. But ultimately, it's up to them to cultivate those relationships and make that work. All right. And there's been a bunch of questions about, do we have the same commission tiers in Alabama as we have in Georgia? Um, <clears throat> I guess I can just answer that real quick. Uh, basically, no, it's, it's a very different market over there right now. But things are getting better. Things are getting better in the states that have struggled in 15, 16. Um, but basically, it's about like a 40 to 50 percent cut. The structure, the, the structure is exactly the same, but it's about like 40 percent less items per tier. So Stan and Alan and John, several of us, I guess y'all are in Georgia. Um, but the expectations are still there. The more you write, the more you make, and you don't make good money until you write a good amount of business. Yeah, and actually, that, just to kind of add to that, that's, that's very similar to the way the company does with our growth goals, right? I mean, everybody has basically the same structure, but you have goals that are based off the market and what's expected, you know, based on your position within that market. But the overall idea is the same. So you could take that platform, that, that structure that, that we gave you, that, that we'll give you, and look at it and say, okay, well, maybe the, the, the top end is not that for me because of where we are. Now, I'd be careful about selling yourself short, um, but you do need to analyze where you are and what your market looks like and what you would able, be able to achieve. I'm a strong proponent, and we're going to add it next month for a 200-plus tier. It's, it's, I just think we need to continue pushing the envelope for that and show people, look, this this is this is possible. I mean, don't think that 10 items a day is not something that you can do because you've done it before, right? So why can't you do it over and over? So be careful about changing it too much. But, yes, it is a little different in Alabama than it is in Georgia. Um, we still are going to continue to push that envelope over there and keep moving forward. And But the overall structure is the same. All right. And Scott asked a question. What do you pay on renewals, if anything? Uh, I personally don't pay on renewals. Uh, Craig, do you pay on renewals? I, I am. You asked me this question. It's like I was already holding up the big no sign when, when he asked that question before he got out of his mouth. The renewals, look, this business, the, the, whole, the equity portion of it is your renewals. Right? I mean, and, and obviously the, the ability to sell it. I, I'm not. I'm the one that invested the money. I'm the one that takes the chances. I'm the one that went out there and stuck my neck out. I'm not doing that. Now, I give, I'm give. i already giving them way more. We're not giving. I'm rewarding them with way more comp than what they're actually bringing in to the agency. I do that every month, every year. So are they kind of getting the renewals? I guess they kind of are. They're getting the advanced before they're actually paid to me, right, because they may make 125000 that year. They don't bring in 125000 in new business and renewals based on the, the business that they wrote. But, no, I'm not about to start doing because I think that, that causes a lot of problems and, and can put people in a position where they're not incentivized the right way. But me, just as, as an owner, there's no way I would ever for anybody uh, pay anybody renewals. I got them a salary. We can adjust the salary as we go based on the position and all that. But I'm, I'm not going to pay renewals. All right, and Diane asks, how many hours does your best LSP work, 
and do they have an assistant or processor due to the sheer volume that he or she is doing? Look, our, our best producer, look, we, they don't work a lot more than anybody else. We're open Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 5.30. There's times when they stay a little bit late working on a deal to get it done. Um, yes, we do have assistance. Once they have proven their self, you know, when they get to 75 items or more, then they're eligible for an assistant to come in and help them do things. If they're not writing 75 items or more in a month, then they don't need an assistant. There's time for them to do things on their own. But once someone has demonstrated the ability to get to that point, and we have people that, you know, they're, all the assistants now, I guess, are for people that have been well over 100 many times, then yes, absolutely, we provide them help. Because, again, it's just about specializing further and further and further, right? So if I can invest in somebody that can help take a lot of busy work off of somebody, that, I mean, what's the value of someone working and writing 125 items in a month? I mean, what's their hourly value? Whatever that hourly value is, should they really be doing admin work that I could pay somebody else 8 or 10 bucks an hour? Probably not. That, that, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So, yes, we have assistance, but the amount of time that they're working um, – you know, is, is Monday through Friday, and, and the requirements, this question comes up a lot, and maybe kind of what you're going into, when it comes to the T-Docs, when it comes to inspections, where there's a relationship required to get that done, meaning that it would be easier for the producer to just simply make a phone call to the customer and get it knocked out, that's their responsibility to get that done. The assistants are typically taking care of paperwork and, you know, things that are not required of a every relationship that, that, because they, they may need, they may have to call somebody 15 times to accomplish the same thing that that producer could, could accomplish in one call. But ultimately that's their responsibility. It's up to the producer to make all that stuff happen. The assistant is there to help them. But you nailed it. I mean, I think you nailed it. Your system is literally almost the same as mine where I, I call it like a support role that kind of supports those little nuances here and there and honestly, yeah, my top people probably work less than my best pe or my lowest people because that's the natural order of things, right? The yeah, let me tell this story, and I tell this story sometimes. So maybe some of you heard it, but it's a great story about me in high school and my dad. My dad's like a straight off the boat Turkish guy, right? And he's 80 years old, and I'm 35. So imagine we didn't talk about like girls and this type of stuff. It was all about save your money and do good in school. So in high school, he would always remind me that my friend Brian was much smarter than me. And I always say, why? Why do you keep reminding me of that? And he said, I just want you to know that he's much smarter than you. I was like, I get it, dad. He's like, but I still expect you to do, you know, as good or better than Brian. I said, I get it. He's like, but he's much smarter than you. You understand that, right? I said, what's the big point here? And here's what he would say. He's like, here's the difference that you need to understand. Time take the exam and get an A. You are not that smart. You have to read a book seven times, but when you take the exam, you still get an A. The end result is the same. So when we look at our producers, it might take one guy 40 or 35 hours a week to hit 60, 70 items a month, right? Because he's got it. He's got that it factor, but your new producers are gonna have to do a little bit more. But guess what, guys? The result can be the same, 60 to 70 items. We'll say we hire potential, right? We hire these gems that we build up because we believe that they can achieve those results. Their path to getting there may be a little bit different, but the end result expectation is the same across the board, just like my dad said. Cool. Awesome, Tolga. Thanks so much. And I've got a question here from Brandy. Can you give some ideas on how to convert to a specialized agency environment? Craig? Sure. I, th I think what you do, what I did years ago is you, know, you look at the people that you've got, you look at the things that everybody's doing, and start figuring out what are people really good at. You know, it's, it's just like a football team. You know, you've got a quarterback, you've got a linebacker, you've got people on the line. You have people, people in different positions, and your job – is to get the right people in the right spots based on their ability. So if you even if you just have three people, it's like what could someone be really good at on the who's who's good at service, who's good at sales? That's really the first way to break it up. Figure out who is who's going to fit into that role, and just start delegating out of, in that order. Because look, if you have everybody trying to do everything, then nobody is going to be good at anything. That's just the way it works. Nobody is going to be great at handling claims, sales service, admin work, 
operations. It's just not possible. So the sooner you can start breaking that down and delegating that work to people where their skill set fits that particular line of work, the better off you're going to be. And I don't think it's, it ever stops. Like right now, my next, my next hire in terms of this position may very well be a recruiter. Maybe somebody we just bring on full time to actually do recruiting and do interviewing and do hiring and, and, and that part of the job to further specialize in that area where it's not all on one person. So, like for you know, for example, several years ago we had operations manager. Well, now we have an operations manager plus there's another operations manager for the other operations in Atlanta. Then we have a sales manager, we have a customer experience manager. We have different people that at one time were doing all the work of that one person, right? So. Specialization never ends, but the first step is figuring out who you got, who's good at what, and hopefully you can divide it up into sales and into service at a minimum. Because, look, salespeople, back when they were, everybody was doing everything, at the end of the day, you know, how, how many hours did you get today? This is back before we had any kind of agency Zoom or anything. You just ask them, how many hours did you do today? Well, I was busy. I had to do this claim. I had to take this payment. I had to do this, all these endorsements. Well, when you specialize, and those people are no longer in the service world, now they don't have any excuses. And with VoIP technology, with the ability to monitor everything that's going on, holding people accountable is so easy today, especially when you're specialized. So at the end of the day, heck, before the end of the day, you know how many phone calls they made. You can look and see how many quotes they've done. You know what's going on with that person, but there's no excuses. But mainly, you're putting the right person in the right role so they can do the job the best, right? You wouldn't have a quarterback playing linebacker someplace. That doesn't make any sense. If he's really great at playing the quarterback, he plays quarterback. The linebacker plays linebacker because you swap positions, now the team is not as good as it used to be. So the whole thing is go ahead and get started, divide it up into sales and service based on ability, and never stop. Keep specializing as you go. All right, we have several more questions. Maybe we can kind of rapid fire them. You want to try? Um, so I've got a question here from Leslie. How do you reward or compensate CSRs for cross-selling? I don't. You want to take? I, I don't either. I mean, it's just part of their comp plan. So you right. know, the, the reward is what they make in their commissions, but there's nothing there's nothing extra on top of that. Okay, and Alan asks, are your new hires expected to work more than 40 hours? No. Craig answered that. No. We're open from 8.30 to 5.30, Monday through Friday. There's plenty of time in the day to get all this business written if you're doing it the right way. Yep. Um, let's see here. Diane asks, do you separate auto and home, or do they do all lines? Craig, why don't you take that, bundling and trusted advisor? Oh, yeah. It, look, it's we we our whole system – is based on the trusted advisor model. You know, we 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 approach this as we're the we're the doctors of insurance, right? So when someone comes in, we evaluate where they are, we look at the gaps, we find out what they need, and then we diagnose and treat with a specialized package at the end based on what it is that they need. You know, so that could be different for a lot of different people, and it is different for a lot of different people. But it would never be, hey, you go over this person for auto, you go this person for home. We should be writing auto, home, umbrella all the motorcycle, whatever, life, all that should be done by one person. The only thing that may be delegated would be the ALR, where that may be beyond a basic term or something very simple that may go to the EFS. But, no, we want them to handle all the PNC business at one time. And Sandy asked probably what many have been asking and talks of all those expectations and stuff. Sandy asks, about how many staff do you turn over in a year? That's a good question. Um, actually, the staff turnover is not that high. You know, for one thing, we have a very comprehensive hiring process. It's 10 steps that is really designed more to weed out the bad than it is to hire the good. So someone that makes it through all 10 steps, if they make it through all 10 steps, including that 50 deck sheets at the very end, the chances of them making it are pretty good. If, the, if, if, if we're going to lose them, it's going to be in that very first week. But we don't, we don't really have a lot of turnover because we take people through this, this process. Now, I will say, Turnover is not always bad. I mean, if, if, if you are constantly upgrading your team, as long as you're hiring people the right way, you know, I wouldn't worry about it a whole – years ago I had a lot of turnover, um, and I was constantly upgrading. I was learning, and I was getting better. It's part of the process that weeds out a lot of the bad. You know, we, we basically are trying 
to push them away, right? Every step that we go through, it's like, okay, if you make it through this, then great, we'll, we'll keep going. It's almost like we don't want them to come on as we go through everything because we don't want the bad ones. We want the good ones. The good ones make it through. The bad ones do not. But overall, um, we haven't had a whole lot. And I see the, the question about licensing. Everybody's required to have a license before they start. You know, there's a lot of careers out there that require a college education, right? Four or five years of school, tens of thousands of dollars, maybe a lot of debt. I just need somebody to make like a month and a half commitment, spend a few hundred dollars, and then come on. Those people coming out of college, they're going and getting a job making 40 or 50 grand a year at best. They can come here and make double that, right? So I want them to be invested in that. I will never hire anybody that doesn't have a license and take a chance on that. I did that years ago. That's a huge mistake. Make sure they've got a license. Make them pay for it themselves. Have some skin in the game. You know, be committed to it. Um, but definitely need a license before they before they come aboard. All right. And I've got a question here from Joseph L. Um, Joseph says, do you require a new hire that's currently with another carrier who's PNC licensed and life and health licensed with about a year and a half experience? Would you require them to also bring in deck pages? Yes, we would. Um, and honestly, we're not real big fans of bringing somebody from another agency. Um, a year and a half, maybe. When they get to five or ten years and they have all that those preconceived notions and all the baggage, look, most agencies are run like crap, right? I mean, they they just are. So why do I want to hire somebody out of that environment, bring them into mine, and then try to have to retrain all that? What we really look for is talent and ability. If they've got the talent and the ability, then we'll teach them the insurance, right? I, if I'm if I'm trying to recruit a quarterback from my football team. I don't want a guy that just knows the playbook. I want to know. I want a guy that can play quarterback, and then I'll teach him the playbook. So, yes, if they're coming, I don't care where they're coming from. That's one of the requirements. You've got to have 50 deck pages before you start. If if you can't, if you can't get 50 deck pages, let's say we talk to them and they're going to start in two weeks. If you can't get 50 deck pages in two weeks' time, how in the world are you ever going to build a prospect and generate the business that you need to generate to help us be successful? It's just not going to happen. So regardless of where they come from, that standard, that's, that's always going to be there. Got a question here from Chris. Are your salespeople also life licensed? Paul Goop, you want to take that one? Sure, yeah. So uh, three of mine are, and everybody received a broadcast message from me that they must be licensed by July 1st. So, yeah, uh, every moving forward, that's the case. It's just there's just way too much um, – IPS upside potential this year. The game changes, and guess what? We change with the game. That's right. And that's interesting because you literally go into the first question that was asked at 120 from Ed. Can you explain further how the ARR multiplier works and other IPS upside opportunities? So that goes into the very first question that was asked. We're almost to the end. I was working backwards. <laughs> Who wants to take that? Tolga? Um, so on my comp plan, mine's a little bit different than uh, Craig's. I have a booster to where they would leave a significant amount of money on the table for not achieving IPS results. And when I say significant, we could be talking about over $1,000 easily each month. So, you know, you could be talking about $12,000. So the IPS is uh, the potential that it unlocks in my comp plan is, is substantial. So the Just AKA, it. it's a part of their job. Go, go to our comp plan real quick if you can. It, on ours, it's, it's very similar. You know, if you look at that, say someone does, if you look at the comp plan right now, let's say they got 130 items, right, and they don't have any life apps. Instead of being at 12% commission, they'd be at three and a half. Okay, so we, we require um, we require life apps in order to play. And, and I tell you what, the biggest thing for us this year is we've, we've got away so much from focusing on the IPS and the bonus and all that and really spent a lot of time working with our people on just doing the right thing. You know, if you pull your CSRP up, you're an Allstate agent, you pull your CSRP up and you look at the percentage of people that have life with you, most people on this call, it's probably going to be under 20. A lot of people, it's going to be under 10. So what that means, let's just say you're at 20. 80% of the time when someone calls you 
and their husband's just been diagnosed with stage four cancer, they've been killed in a car wreck, and they ask that question, hey, did he ever get life insurance with you guys? 80% of the time, the answer is going to be no, which is pathetic. I mean, we're, we're, doing, we're doing a terrible job on that. So I'm really trying to change the culture with that, that, look, as a trusted advisor, as someone's agent, as, as having this relationship with them, we need to do the right thing and not worry about, you know, the IPS and the goals and the bonuses and all that. You know, we should be writing 50 apps a month, not 50 apps over six months. So, and, and that's because we need to insure more people. And I think having that kind of tone, you know, we really started off the year with that this year with some community service requirements and that type of thing. That's really helped a lot. Um, life insurance is something that obviously people don't have to have, and a lot of people struggle with asking for it and, you know, pivoting from PNC to life. You really got to figure out what works in your agency. For us, changing the minds and, and just the attitude of, hey, let's do the right thing for these people. I'm sick and tired of hearing about people calling in and they don't have coverage with us because we didn't do a good job. And, and the more you write and the longer you're here, the more that's going to happen unless you really get on that train and, and start insuring people. And I don't care if they get a $50,000 policy. They just need to get some sort of coverage. So think about the way your agency works, what you're expecting, and the, the overall culture when it comes to life. And you may find some opportunities in there to get a lot better without focusing all the time on the comp. All right, and I've got a question here Any from Larry. Uh, anytime I advertise for new staff and mention the word sales or insurance sales or telemarketing, I almost get no responses. On the sales side, how do you find or advertise for good recruits? I'm all about uh, advertising it for sales because uh, I want salespeople. Um, it could be your market, and I do understand that each market is a little bit different, so I'm not – you know, sure what your market situation is. Maybe it's extremely rural. I don't, I have no idea. But for me, it's all about sales, and I, I only look to hire sales people. I like bartenders. I like servers. People that, when I interview them, they smile. They're people people. And, um, yeah, so I definitely advertise it as sales. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with Toby. I think, you know, if sales, if the word sales in the ad is scaring someone off, then that's probably a good thing. That probably means that we're not going to hire somebody who's going to be afraid to, to, to sell. Just was trying to find a post here where we're doing some recruiting on Facebook. We do a lot of recruiting on Facebook. Um, we do a lot of recruiting when we're out and about. You know, I think that's another. That's one of the best ways to get really good, high quality people. As you're seeing on my Facebook posts for the last three months. <laughs> All right. um, going out and about and just looking at what people are doing as they're dealing with customers and seeing how they're responding to situations. For example, one of our best people. Uh, we got years ago, she was, she was a, a cashier in a tanning salon, but she did a really good job working with customers. She upstole people, great attitude, good with people, you know, all that type of thing. So there's a lot of ways. Uh, there's the post right there that Joseph was looking for, you know, on Facebook where, where you talk about hiring. And we always put, you know, hey, hey here's the opportunity. We'll tie a referral uh, fee or, or sign-in bonus into it a lot of times. Uh, but Facebook is a great way. LinkedIn is a great way. Social media in general, just to talk about the overall opportunity. If you friend me or if you already are friends with me, if you want to grab that post and uh, copy and paste, you're welcome to do so. That verbiage there works really well. We've also done some videos. Jess has done a really good job of some videos where you, he actually walks through the office and shows them, hey, here's your office, what, this, what your opportunity could be, that type of thing. you got to get creative when it comes to recruiting. And I'll give you one little tip on recruiting. A lot of people use Indeed. If you go out to Indeed and you search resumes, um, there will be a thing in there that's, that where you can set up for resume alerts, okay, which means the next time someone has a resume like that come up, it will automatically email it to you. So we subscribe to that on Indeed, just to show you one of the videos now. Um, that process through Indeed has helped us a lot, and it's totally free. You know, so you just search for, you search for resumes, and then you click the button that says, you know, alert me for these types of resumes going forward. And then depending on your market, you might get a, you might get an email every day that has new resumes that are just like the ones you just searched in your inbox. And then you can you know reach out to those people and and try to find folks. But but back to the original question about the word sales. If you have the word sales in your in your ad and you're and you're running people off, that's not always a bad thing. I mean they got to be a sales minded person or this just isn't going to work. 
All right, I'll leave it to the guys to wrap us up. And thank you. We actually have almost 300 people still on this call. You guys stuck with us. Thank you for joining us. But I'll pass it back to Craig and Tolga to wrap us up. Yeah, I'll let you wrap, Tolga. But hey, I just want to say, I just want to appreciate Tolga's invite. You know, everybody on this call, if you got anything out of this call, you should thank Tolga because he's the one uh, that came up with the idea. He's the one that came to me uh, to put this thing together and, and reach out and and, and I think it's a great way to try to help people because a lot of people need help with, with, with the topics that we cover today. But, Toga, thanks a lot, man. You're doing great things. I'm a huge fan of Agency Zoom. You know, again, guys, if you're not involved in that, you are you are missing the boat big time. The amount of money you spend on that to keep your people, if nothing else, just to understand where they are and what the score is, you know, that's, it's just a no-brainer. But he he's amazing at what he does. He's, he's very responsive. He's innovative. That product is changing over time and getting better and better. He's adding, and you know, he's got some other things going on that you know maybe he might want to talk about. But but thanks again, Toga, for for involving me. I really Thank really you. appreciate it. And uh, you know maybe uh, maybe we can do another one like this sometime soon. Well, I appreciate uh, Craig you jumping on here, and uh, it's the most common thing that I spend time on talking to people about your comp plans. And who better else than to bring you on here, Craig, with your expertise and your 23 years of experience. This is what it's about. This is what we're talking about today. What we're talking about is building compliance that win. And that's a part of that is investing in your people that you implement and the expectations and the high expectations um, that we have. And I would, I would love to do stuff like this more often for sure. So um, with that being said, I really appreciate uh, everybody being on here. That being said, that's all I got for today. Thank you so much.